and the message was very clear. If you begin to um, A, find, and B, publicize the fact that children do best when they have fathers uh, about equally involved, um, you can forget about our support. So I could see my career going down the hill. I could see, you know, I could uh, if I were to continue to find um, these outcomes. But the truth is that the longer, the more, the more years went by, the better the research was, the more it controlled for all the variables that, that were allowed it to be criti criticized. And so I kept, and um, I didn't shut my mouth about it. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Warren Farrell. He's the author of The Boy Crisis. What an amazing piece of work. This is really a book around parenting and the importance of not only men's role and, and the father's role in raising children, but also uh, mum's role and, and this tension that plays out. I think what Warren has done exceptionally well is he's incredibly eloquent in discussing this, but he's also articulate in, in talking about what those challenges are. There were times in, in the interview where I thought that Warren was uh, living in my family home or, or watching on cameras because he was describing exactly what I've been experiencing. Um, and the differences between my style of parenting and my wife's style of parenting. You're going to really love this episode. I'm, I'm just so pleased to, to be able to have Dr. Farrell on, on the show. So enjoy and please share, comment, um, you know, tell people about it. The more subscribers that we have, you know, the more I'm able to go out and get these great guests to, to share their knowledge and expertise. So thanks very much in advance for that too. Welcome back to Better Thinking. Today I have Warren Farrell, the author of The Boy Crisis, and I'm absolutely uh, pleased with myself that I was able to get su such a great, you know, speaker and author on the show to talk about, you know, the boy crisis, you know, male sort of issues and and, and challenges that you know are, are really prevalent here now, and you know. Where, where we are almost 2020 um, and, and I think it's important to give a voice to that and I can't think of anyone better um, than Warren so welcome to the show. Thank you I'm looking forward to our talking together. Tell me a little bit about I know that uh, uh, we're, we're, we're quite compressed on time so I just want to jump straight in tell me a little bit about how this uh, book came uh, came together. What what compelled you to 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 start sort of um, you know, discussing this topic and looking at it in 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 the way that you do? Well, my my original background was with the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City, and I'd been involved in the early feminist movement in the United States um, in 1969 uh, when it sort of surfaced in major public view and then decided to change my doctoral dissertation topic to um, the topic of feminism as a political movement. And that got me interested in the National Organization for Women in New York City. And then eventually I was asked to be on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women and spoke all around the world, um, I guess as the leading male feminist of the time, did a huge amount of publicity on you know, the major TV shows um, nationwide and worldwide and um and uh, etc and so then in the 70s um mid 70s i noticed that there were a significant uh, number of divorces that were occurring and that um, the first data began to show that the children of divorce um, who did not have a lot of father involvement that they were having a lot of troubles. So I brought this up with the board of uh, uh, now, the National Organization for Women in New York City, and sort of the, the response was a little bit of a frozen response, like, um, you know, what are you saying, Warren? Um, you, you know that a lot of our now members, uh, they want to be able to have the choice of whether they raise the children by themselves after divorce or whether they share that responsibility with the fathers. And the, the mothers know best about what's best for the children. And so they should be able to make that decision. And besides, um, our now members are saying that if you're going to be focusing on the theory of equality and having the children be equally involved with both father and mother, I'm not going to be in favor. Uh, I'm, not going to, I'm going to withdraw and take away my membership from now. And now is in a, in a bind politically because they knew 
they had a lot of fish to fry. They had many, many things that they were concerned about, not just custody issues. And that if they started dividing feminists uh, or people who are now members up into people who agreed and disagreed uh, with them, uh, then they were going to lose some membership and lose some base. And so they were concerned with that. And I, my response was, there are times when you have to make tough decisions and when an entire, you know, if this is going to be, if this data is um, going to be proven to be true, that is the data that shows that children of divorce who do not have a lot of contact with their uh, fathers um, do much worse in a lot of different areas than, than children of divorce who do have contact with their fathers or children who do, who are of intact families. Um, and we, you, uh, choose uh, as now to ignore uh, the benefit of the children, then you're undermining the very meaning of what it means to be a mother. And you're, you're undermining integrity. Um, you know, we all care about the next generation. And these are not just, you know, um, boys that are growing up that, that are not doing as well, but they're also our daughters as well. And you can pretend to be feminist if you're not in favor of our daughter's better interests. And they just sort of like froze um, in response to me, and they said, "Well, you said you said yourself, you know, Warren, uh, that the that the research is in its infancy because we've just beginning to get a large number of divorces and just beginning to be able to see, you know, what happens to these children. The studies aren't longitudinal; uh, many of them are yet to be published or are in process. So." Why don't you see, you know, what you find? So the message I got clearly is that here now, it's in the uh, mid seventies, and about um, I'm making a very, very substantial income um, from speaking all around the world on behalf of feminist issues. And the message was very clear: if you begin to um, a find and be publicized the fact that children do best when they have fathers uh, about equally involved, um, you can forget about our support. So I could see my career going down the hill. I could see, you know, I could, uh, if I were to continue to find um, these outcomes. But the truth is that the longer, the more, the more years went by, the better the research was, the more it controlled for all the variables that, that were allowed it to be criti criticized. And so I kept, and um, I didn't shut my mouth about it. I, I, I made a decision that I would risk uh, my career um, to, um, to focus on what I felt was accurate and that hopefully enough people would, you know, um, uh, be in accordance with me that I wouldn't completely lose all my opportunities. Um, I, but my hope was, um, was a little bit optimistic. Um, I went from about 50 to 60 speaking engagements per year at universities to zero speaking engagements at universities and, um, and, and went from a very substantial income to fortunately being able to save enough of that income to be able to sustain myself uh, through, uh, you know, a few, a few decades of very minimal income. And so, um, and, but I decided that I would do the best I could. And, um, and if I couldn't do it, I would, you know, quit the effort and become a professor somewhere uh, since I at least had a PhD. And, um, and so that was sort of my mental uh, decision. That's a really big fork in the road to have something that, you know, you, you, you've clearly been working on and, and wanting to progress and has lots of wonderful elements to it, but then stumbling upon, you know, uh, research or data which is going out and suggesting that we move away from an idea um, and, and I'm sort of conflicted about whether to call it an, an, an ideal versus an idea, um, but I think when something's held really, really tightly, it, it tends to start becoming an ideal. Um, and you're kind of saying we've got to listen to the data and, and yeah. you know, even if it wasn't, you know, complete and, you know, having a 30-year a longitudinal um, a study attached to it and I'm not sure what it, what it was, but it sounds it must have been substantial for you to go out and say we've got to listen to this. We can't turn a blind eye to this. Our, our, our children are, you know, are, are going to, um, you know, uh, be the ones that end up, you know, with, with – um, Lesser, lesser opportunities or lesser future if, if we don't go out and at least voice this so people can make decisions about how they, how they um, do life, whether they're separating or not. Absolutely. And at the beginning here, you know, when I first started, to, so about 14 years ago, to sort of fast forward a bit, 
I started doing the research on what became the Boy Crisis book, and um, and I started looking at my 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 initial submission of the uh, project to my publisher had um, 10 causes of the boy crisis um, uh, listed as um, causes that I'd come up with from my initial research. But I, the more research I did, the more I found that, uh, so for example, let's say um, one of the causes that I had listed was the feminization of education and the fact that in, um, in elementary schools, um, almost all the teachers are females. And I saw that when um, boys went from female only homes to female only schools, um, that is female teacher only schools, uh, that there was that these boys did really badly. However, I found out that when the boys had fathers at home who were involved with the, them, and they went from uh, a father involved family to a female dominated school system in, ele in elementary school, uh, that the boys had it had a, a little bit of an impact, but it wasn't a huge impact. That is, that I, I began to see that the involvement of the father was more powerful, was more the hub cause, was more the cause. And when that was, uh, when the father was involved, the, the boy was less vulnerable. It was like the, his roots were deeper and the wind, the wind, the adverse winds did not blow him over. Um, the roots of his tree, so to speak, were deeper. And so, whereas when he didn't have that the father involvement roots, um, he, the any vulnerability, the, um, the addiction to video games, it, um, interest in guns, interest in withdraw, uh, desire to withdraw from people, lack of success at work, a bad teacher, uh, things that um, they, they would affect him and they would be, and so um, government officials would look at, you know, look at things and say, oh, you know, it's a matter of mental illness. Well, the, tr the truth is mental illness did evolve but it evolved much more frequently in the um, in the boy among the boys who did not have a significant amount of father involvement, and so it wasn't that mental illness led to the boys doing badly. It was that the the f lack of father involvement um, made made the boy often depressed that he couldn't do well in school and he didn't have the discipline to do well in school. So I started looking at okay, what is there about? dad deprivation uh, that is so important you know um, I thought fathers were important but I never thought they were this important I never thought they were the primary cause I never thought I'd come to a conclusion that say said the boy crisis resides where dads do not reside I never thought I would look at the, our program in the United States called no child left behind and come to the conclusion that you you will always have a child, not always, but you will significantly, with significant frequency, have a child left behind if you have a parent left behind. And so this got me to ask a deeper set of questions, which is exactly what is the, what do dads contribute to the parenting process that no one understands? And, include, and that no one means dads too. Dads don't, you know, the, the nine differences between dad style parenting and mom style parenting uh, that I discuss in the Boy Crisis book, uh, you, you may have you know, seen those, uh, you know, like differences like dad's tendency to roughhouse versus um, dad's tendency, uh, mom's tendency to not roughhouse, dad's tendency to tease, tease the children versus mom's tendency to think that teasing is really a type of abuse of the child uh, or, um, you know, at least at the very least insensitive. Uh, dad's tendency to take the children camping and say, um, you know, and, and say to the ch children, okay, you know, yes, you can go on a walk by yourselves and you can go down to a lake that you'll see in the distance, but be careful. And mom's tendency to say, no, 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 go with him, go with him. And dad's feeling that, you know, no, the, maybe if he or she gets lost, lost, you must be kidding. How can you even think about our daughter or son getting lost? Uh, no, getting lost, they'll find their way back. Um, how do you know? How do you know? How, you, how do you know? And dad says, just let me, you know, give them a chance to get lost and to and and when they know that I'm not with them, they'll be paying far more careful attention to how not to get lost, and that will create um, skill sets that they will not have otherwise. And so many dads don't explain it very well, and so moms can't hear what dads don't say. And so um, I began to see that the children that did the best had what I came to call checks and balance parenting. They had a an active tension 
between the mom style parenting, which is more protective and nurturing and, uh, and the dad style parenting. And so, um, and so then I started looking more deeply and saying, you know, what, well, what is that about exactly? And what are some examples of that? And one example of that is that uh, moms will tend in mom style parenting to sort of be very sensitive, let's say, to the boy and girl's talents. And if the boy sings real well, she'll suggest, oh, sweetie, maybe you can be a singer, or maybe you can be a musician, or maybe you can be an actor, if the, a writer, if the skills are different. And moms are great at that and, and seeing the sensitivities of their sons. Um, however, uh, when the father wasn't involved, the boy would often try to be the musician and he wouldn't have the discipline to study every day. He'd be, uh, he wouldn't have postponed gratification. So I said to myself, you know, well, where does that postponed gratification come from? And why is it so highly correlated with fathers? Um, and so I began to see that there were differences in the way that boundaries were, uh, boundary enforcement. So there's three steps here. Um, dads and moms both in set boundaries pretty much the same way. Moms set boundaries actually more frequently than dads do. Um, and so, but moms and dads will both tend to say things on the setting of boundaries, such as, um, you know, sweetie, you can't have your ice cream until you finish your peas. Um, and then children will test boundaries the same way. They'll try to have as few peas as possible <laughs> before they get their ice cream. Um, the difference is in the way dads and moms, on average, and sometimes this is reversed, uh, tend to enforce boundaries. And so the, the child with the mom um, will, will start testing um, how we can get um, the fewest peas possible before he gets the ice cream. And he might say one day, you know, oh, I, I, I had a bully in school today. Um, and, you know, and he was really picking on me. He's the same one I mentioned last week. And mom will go, oh, okay. Um, I'm so sorry about that, sweetie. I'll tell you what, just have this many more peas and then you can have your ice cream. So now the sun is catching. Aha. Uh -huh. There are certain things I can say and do to manipulate my mom to eat, eat fewer peas in order to get the ice cream. Dad is more likely to say, I'm really sorry about that, you being bullied. But we do have a deal here about the ice cream, and that is that you can't have your ice cream until you finish your peas. If you're kind of down today and you don't want to finish your peas, that's okay. You don't have to have your ice cream or your peas. Um, but if you want your ice cream, you've got to finish your peas. Oh, you're so mean. You don't even, you know, I mentioned things like this. Mommy pays attention to it and lets me have fewer peas. That's mom, but it's not me. And if you keep whining and complaining like that, tomorrow night you can't, there will be no ice cream either. And so the boy then begins to say, <laughs> oh, darn, with dad, I have no options but to finish my peas. But with moms, I have an option as to how to manipulate her better in order to have fewer peas. And so the findings that come from this type of difference are amazing. So for example, ADHD, we know that boys are far more likely than girls to have ADHD. Um, most studies show about four times as likely to have ADHD. But when we look deeply at ADHD, we find that children that are raised predominantly by dads, only uh, boys that are pre raised predominantly by dads, only 15% of them have ADHD. But boys raised predominantly by moms, 30% of them have ADHD. And so this is, um, so you get some- uh, That's sense astonishing. And if you connect that with what I was just talking about, boundary enforcement, with the, bo with the father, the boy has no option but to focus his attention on what he needs to do, eat the peas, in order to get what he wants to have, the ice cream. Whereas with mom, boys can, boys can be constantly thinking about What's the best way I can manipulate a better deal? What's worked in the past? What will work in the future? And not focus his attention on finishing his peas. Well, here is the big outcome of all of what I've been saying, which is the slippery slope to disaster, to mass shootings, to um, imprisonment, to crimes, and to uh, joining ISIS and stuff like this. Here's the, here's the slippery slope. The child with the father, with the mother, is more likely on average to go to school. And because he doesn't have postponed gratification, he does, hasn't been forced to, uh, figure, to, to finish what he's starting, will get more easily distracted by the first text that comes in or the first invitation to play a video game. And so uh, he'll not finish his homework. So he starts receiving less praise from teachers than kids that have postponed gratification. 
then he tries to go out, go out for um, maybe an acting job or a sports job or you know, to be on the sports team. And he might be tall and have good skills um, but, um, or play soccer really well, but he doesn't rehearse the drills as well as somebody else. And so this, the talents that mom is saying, pay attention to, you have them, um, he fails at. And so mom is very good at helping him dream. But if he doesn't have the discipline, he doesn't fulfill his dream. And after a while, he becomes afraid to dream. And that becomes the beginning of the slippery slope. He begins to feel ashamed of himself. Pair, um, teachers aren't praising him. Peers aren't praising him. It comes to boy-girl time. Most boys are heterosexual. Um, he's interested in girls. And he starts seeing that girls don't date losers. They date winners. And so he's beginning to feel rejected. So he begins to turn to pornography because pornography is access to a variety of attractive women without fear of rejection at a price he can afford. And so, he be so then he becomes addicted to pornography and he starts treating girls as somebody in the pornogra pornography movie. So when he does have an interest from a real life girl, he starts treating her as what works in the movie, which, which is where in the pornography, which is where he's learned his sex from. And the girl feels treated like an object because she's being treated like an object. And she withdraws, which only proves to him that he's a loser um, and makes him turn back to the pornography because that's, again, access to a variety of, of um, attractive women without fear of rejection. The same type of thing happens with video games. He feels like he, he's not a winner at school or in reality. Um, so he starts um, finding a, way, a video game that he can be a winner at. And in order to be a winner, he has to focus on the video game. And when he starts focusing on the video game, he becomes addicted to the video game. And so video games and video um, uh, in general, which improve one's intelligence and, and many skill sets in many ways, when at the addiction level, it begins to have the opposite effect, uh, where it really, uh, where it makes him not be able to function effectively in real life uh, situations. His dopamine is constantly being stimulated by the ability of the, the video game designers to constantly focus on increasing dopamine, which is the feel, the feel good drug. And so these are some of the ways, and so in worst case scenarios, this boy becomes angry at teachers, becomes angry um, at, at, and withdrawing and becomes depressed. And in very worst case scenarios, it becomes, he be, may become suicidal. So the suicide rate among boys increases between the ages of nine and 25, um, from going to, from, uh, to equal to girls to four and a half times what girls' uh, suicide rate is. Boys' suicide rates have been going up recently, boys' life expectancy, male life expectancy has been going down. Um, and so we have seen, uh, and then in the worst, super worst case scenarios, only a small percentage, uh, the boy gets so angry at all the people at school that have rejected him that in the United States where there are guns available, he may that may result in a mass shooting or a school shooting um, as, as a way of saying, for, you know, um, when I shoot up these people, um, I'll make the headlines and somebody will say, gee, I did notice that Jimmy was withdrawn. I wish I had paid more attention to him. For once in their life, they'll wish they paid attention to me. That's the worst case scenario. In some sense, if I'm getting, if I'm getting this right, what you're saying is that over time, over in, in some sense, uh, some decades now, as there has been more and more appreciation of uh, the female role and the importance of that, uh, uh, that uh, quite a number of men have also started to lean in that direction where they've also become quite, um, uh, if I can use the word, um, uh, compassionate not suggesting that men weren't compassionate before but uh, uh if i can maybe use the word soft or, or, or gentle and, and 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 kind of hold a a softer space you're kind of saying that with that softness if it's just allowed for that it doesn't provide enough of that tension that you call between a mum and a dad the, the tension starts to slacken off and there's a there's a health benefit for boys that there is both a mum and a dad to have a tension between 
one that can be incredibly nurturing, not suggesting that dads can't be um, and vice versa, but where mums can be very nurturing and dads can also have a stronger disciplinary sort of a, a space. And when there's that tension, um, and we probably see this in the literature and attachment theory in psychology, when there's, when there's that nice tension, a child, and in this case a boy, gets both of those spaces. They know they're safe and they're being nurtured, but they're also encouraged to explore and take things further and dream and, and achieve and have delayed gratification and so on. If the child is put in a position where the slack is taken out of that tension, whether it be, you know, it's a female-dominated uh, uh, you know, um, household and a female-dominated school, um, or if it happens to be a, a male-dominated family and a male-dominated school, the slack, the, the, the tension would be wrong and, and with their life's problems. And obviously, with our schooling system being predominantly women, and I'm, I, I believe that's fairly universal around the world, uh, and obviously, this space of, you know, when there are divorces, uh, obviously, particularly with young kids, and obviously, I'm assuming that, that, that dads often uh, do, do spend more hours at work on average is my understanding. There is a propensity for, for our children to be, um, spend more time with um, their mum. And so, what you're saying is that there, there are some negative effects that come from that and, and it's important to be cognizant to look at the tension we're not going out and saying that you know uh mums are terrible for kids or uh, uh, dads are more superior we're, we're talking about the tension and and society has shifted over these the, 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 these decades how that tension looks because um, yeah. when you were describing you know what, what mums and dads do uh, i was thinking warren have you been have you been uh, setting up cameras inside my house you know <laughs> Um, you know, if you're going to have to eat the peas, you're going to have to eat all of them. And if you don't eat all of them, and that includes that last one that you'll, you know, beg and bargain on and negotiate on, no, every pea. And, and until every pea's done, you're not getting dessert. As a matter of fact, often you're not getting dessert anyway. You're just eating all your peas. Um, and that's just how it is. But it's fascinating that you're describing it. You know, in, in, in such a way, I'm sure a lot of our listeners, you know, would also relate to that. I'm sure, obviously not every single person, but, but they, that, that tension is, 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 is true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly is the way I see it. And obviously with working with lots of my clients, you know, couples, a lot of the challenges are about discipline and what the rules are. Um, and we're kind of saying that both of them are healthy. They're, 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 they're yeah. needed, both that nurturing and that, and that um, you know, firmness at the same time. Absolutely. Um, children need to know that they're unconditionally loved and moms and dads have a way of unconditionally loving, different ways of unconditionally loving the children. They both unconditionally love the children, but the father puts more conditions on the behavior of the child in order to give approval to the child. But that doesn't mean he loves the child less. It means it's a different way of loving the child. It's more a tough type of love, but it's not less love. And so, and, and dads do this in many ways. And as you know, I really, as you, you heard me say before, uh, this is not mom's fault. It is uh, moms can't hear what dads don't say. And it's not dad's fault because dads, historically speaking, um, you can, dads can go into a parenting magazine in any country and read about parenting all day long. And they'll discover more about the mom style of parenting, but there isn't any, um, talking in most parenting magazines about the value of roughhousing, for example. And so um, dads don't, dads even that are, are research-oriented parents don't tend to be able to discover the power of, of roughhousing. And so when I did the research of the Boy Crisis book, I discovered all these types of behaviors, the ways that dads, um, that dad style pairing parenting operates, but I didn't see any articles on them except in, you know, research that the average person doesn't um, read about in Scientific American or some other type of um, uh, research journal. And I'll give, I'll give an example of this. So, for example, and how the misunderstandings occur. Dads are far more likely than moms to roughhouse with the kids. And so let's say um, da dads um, do, you know, say, uh, okay, kids, time for roughhousing. And the kids go, oh, man, exciting, exciting. And so he takes the three kids, uh, let's say Jimmy, Jane, and, and John, let's say, and throws them on the couch and says, okay, your job is to jump onto my back and pin me down faster than I can before I can pin the three of you down together. Okay, that's fun. And they, they jump on his back, and mom is looking on and going, 
oh God, um, I feel like I have just one more child to monitor here. Uh, what do I do? Do I do I do I <laughs> interfere? And if I interfere, you know, my husband has called me controlling before, so I don't want to interfere. And and it's true, the kids are having a lot of fun, but I just I can just sort of foresee in the future that if this keeps up, somebody sooner or later is going to end up crying or getting hurt. Well, mom is only about ninety nine point nine percent likely to be right, and so she um, so <laughs> so, sooner or later, uh, you know, the rough housing ends in some somebody getting hurt and maybe Johnny stuck his uh, elbow in, in Jane's eye and um, as a way of pushing her aside to be able to uh, win to be the you know the king pinner of the king pinner downers um, in the rough housing and so dad stops the rough housing and and says um, you know and, mom, and he, so he stops the rough housing and mom is going Oh God, finally, um, I, I knew this was gonna happen, but now I'm feeling guilty that I didn't you know, follow my intuition and stop this from happening at this level. Now look, at Jane is hurt and is crying and you know, is, that may not help the relationship with her dad. I feel so badly that I didn't stop it and, and she feels guilty about not stopping sooner. But at least now my hus hubby will, will know to not do this rough housing anymore. But instead, Dad says, "You know, um, Jim, you stuck your finger, your your elbow in um, your sister's eye. That is not okay to win at the roughhousing. If you do that again, uh, there'll be no more roughhousing." Mom's going, "If you do that again, you're going to have this thing go over again." <laughs> and so, um, and so, Dad goes back to the roughhousing with Mom, sort of putting her hands over her face and trying again to keep quiet, and not be controlling. And, um, and so then, sure enough, just as the mom predicted, it happens all over again. And dad goes, and now's where things begin to, the payoff begins to happen. Dad goes, okay, I told you that there, if you did that again, there'd be no more roughhousing. Uh, well, wait a minute, I didn't stick my elbow in, uh, in, in Janie's face. I just pushed her aside. No, that's aggressive. You need to be assertive and not aggressive. Well, what's assertive? Well, you could use leverage. You could use eye contact. You could throw her off guard. You can move in one direction and then go move in another direction and fake her out. Oh, okay. Now I got a little bit more about assertive. So the next time he be becomes assertive, not aggressive. Um, and so, uh, but the next time he says, to, so dad says, okay, to, we won't, no more roughhousing tonight. Tomorrow night we'll pick up the roughhousing again. And mom is going, he really doesn't, he really is a child I have to monitor. He doesn't uh, get it. <laughs> he doesn't get it. But what nobody gets is that the next night is when the payoff starts coming. The next night he says, this, you know, you can't elbow your sister or brother aside. That's being aggressive. Um, and, and now he says the same thing over again. But this time the children, as they get ready to move the other one aside aggressively, realize that they're going to lose their roughhousing if they do that. So they start to hold back from being aggressive and they, and they have learned by experience the difference between being aggressive versus assertive. And they're willing to obey dad for two reasons. One is the roughhousing has created a bond with the dad. Dad is the dad is the roller coaster. He's filled with excitement, but he also, like a roller coaster, provides a safety net, and it's, it's overall safe. And so the the kids are willing to sort of obey, but they mostly are willing to obey because they're going to lose what they love to do. They're going to lose riding on that roller coaster if they don't obey. So the the children are beginning to learn how to think of their sister and brother's needs, which is the beginning of empathy. And so the data on roughhousing shows that when dads or moms or moms roughhouse with children in this type of way that I'm talking about, the roughhousing combined with the boundary enforcement, the children end up having to think of somebody else besides themselves in order to get what they themselves want. So it becomes selfish to think of others. That's the key. And it also yes. becomes selfish to learn how to be assertive versus aggressive. And so the children, and, and that's what dads don't tell, explain to moms in a loving way. 
that still uh, accounts for the fact that the dads may take the roughhousing too much, too far, and and um, that, that a mom may be um, correct in stopping if it if it goes too 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 far, and so uh, but for the most part, dads do provide a very good safety net uh, when they're doing things like roughhousing, and uh, and they do allow for the kids to get hurt, but not hurt in a serious type of way, and that is a distinction that sometimes dads don't make clear that um, all these learning processes are happening um, if. That boundary, if that roughhousing happens with the boundary enforcement, with the uh, the bonding, with the distinctions between being assertive and aggressive, and we now know that children who do this type of roughhousing, they learn this difference between assertiveness and aggressiveness. They learn this empathy, and what happens when a child is more assertive and not aggressive is they develop more friends in school. They are better able to be um, their their emotional intelligence increases, um, and they and they and as a result, at school they feel more successful. School is a bonding activity for the kids. They're more popular. Therefore, they don't have to withdraw into video games uh, when it comes to boy girl time the the girls are interested in the guys that have good emotional intelligence um, and the boys are more disciplined because they have more postponed gratification so they're more likely to not only have emotional intelligence but to succeed at a sport or an activity or um, you know or, or acting or being a musician or and doing well in school and so it's a win-win situation it's also a win for mom because moms when da dads take up the space, don't have to have the pressure on them all the time to always be with the children, always entertaining the children, or choosing between the television or video game and her own uh, involvement with the children. She has another um, a very constructive um, uh, person to work in balance with her in the raising of the children. And again, before I did the research on the boy crisis, I had no idea that this, you know, these types of details and these types of everyday scenario, scenarios that almost everybody says to me exactly what you said before, it feels like you have a camera in my home. Uh, and uh, that you're, you know, this is exactly what goes on with us. And there are dozens of things like this, um, you know, tension around climbing trees, tension around a mother, uh, a, a boy coming home or a girl coming home and saying, you know, Mrs. Millie doesn't like me. Um, you know, I really uh, hate her. I hate her. She hates me. Um, can you go to the principal and have me change classes? And moms will say, oh, sweetie, I don't want you to have a bad experience in school because that could affect the rest of your life. And, and, and out of total goodness, the mother says things like this, which is also a possibility of being true. And the dad, you know, is more likely to say some version of, well, sweetie, in life you have to learn to get along with people who don't like you, and that you don't get, you know, that you don't naturally get along with. Let's see if we can do something about this first. I will make a, me a meeting with the principal, and um, but but ultimately, if things don't work out, but let me make a meeting with the teacher first. But before I make that meeting with the teacher, sweetie, what would you, if when I meet with the teacher, what do you think the teacher will say? Well, the teacher would probably say something like, you know, I'm always talking in class um, and she gets really mad at me. So it may not be you that the teacher dislikes. It may be the talking that you're doing that the teacher dislikes. Well, maybe, maybe. And so this type of conversation happens with the child and then happens with the teacher and then happens between the teacher and the child with the parents present. And then if things can't be worked out and the assessment of the parents, both parents, is that the teacher really is a bad teacher that's insensitive, then you go to the principal. But the child learns by example that first the, um, the, 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 the child is cared for by being heard and listened to but then oh, alternatives, uh, rather than just escaping from the situation or blaming someone else, are available uh, that are um, that that are so important um, to the child to 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 go through that process first, rather than just saying um, you know Jimmy or Joe doesn't like me or you know I'm going to get rid of them or teacher Jim teacher, yeah. teacher Mr James or Mr Johnson. Are men being uh, playing this role less? Uh, is there a hesitancy for, for for dads to behave in this way? What well, what's going on in in, in terms of the, the the current? Is it is it that you know um, that's changing? Has it evolved? What, what what what's your assessment from obviously all of your research and and, and you know the coming of this book? Yes. So when I, when I did the research for the boy crisis, one of the things I discovered is a this was not a U.S. crisis. This was a global crisis. It is a U.S. crisis, but it's a global crisis. 
And B, <coughs> the two biggest causes of the global crisis is that it exists in all 56 developed nations. And so I asked myself, what do developed nations have in common? And developed nations um, have in common that they have enough mastery of survival among the middle and upper middle class that they, <coughs> that they can allow, excuse me, two types of freedoms. One is the freedom to divorce without having to worry about the family being totally impoverished oftentimes. And number two is the freedom to allow women to have children without being married. And so I was, you know, I'm politically more liberal. And so I thought, you know, all right, what's the big deal about having children without being married? But here's the big deal about it. Uh, the 53% of women in the United States who have children without, uh, who are under 30, who have children without being married, um, the children experience one of a few things. They either don't know who the father is, or they know who the father is and have minimal contact with them, or they, the father and mother were living together when the child was born, but oftentimes the child, the, 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 those marriages, la those, those living together situations last with both parents being involved only for only about four years. And usually after those four years, the father is the one that is en ends up um, not being involved in the situation any uh, much at all. The mother often finds a new boyfriend and wants to go on and have a new life. And so the children have a minimal amount of involvement with the, with the father. And, and so it's in that group of children, the children born to unmarried mothers um, that end up, that, that where the father is minimally involved, that's the first group of children in largest numbers that have, that have dad deprivation, that have all the problems that I was talking about. Uh, well, actually, I haven't mentioned a lot of the problems, but the problems include uh, that we talked about the video game addiction, the uh, porn addiction. Uh, the, they're much more likely to be depressed, more likely to be suicidal, more likely to be obese, more likely to be um, ad addicted to drugs, alcohol, uh, more likely to uh, die of overdoses of opioids, uh, especially in the United States, uh, much more likely to be mass shooters. Mass shooters are not only males, um, but they're also dad-deprived males for the most part, about 80%. Um, prisoners, they're more likely to commit crimes, having their testosterone poorly channeled, and that leads to them going to prison. So 93% of the prisoners are males in the United States, and in most countries that's about the, the, that statistic. But what very few people know is that the great majority of those males, about 90%, are dad-deprived males. Uh, they don't have the discipline to to constructively channel their testosterone. They become destructive in, with their testosterone, and they begin to start committing crimes. And then one of the most surprising findings was that ISIS recruits are not only predominantly male, but predominantly dad-deprived males, and the smaller percentage of ISIS recruits who are females are also dad deprived females. And so I began to discover as I, the more research I did, the more I started to see the negative outcomes, the more sophisticated the research was. So it wasn't just a matter of uh, poor uh, children who are poor do worse, but I saw that children who are poor, who had dad involvement, did actually better than children who were wealthy, who had a lack of dad involvement in a number of different academic areas. And so I began to, again, see over and over again that, that it was the, 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 the dad deprivation was much more important than I had ever um, imagined it to be. And that's key here that you're talking about. This is about deprivation. This, this is where, where there's you know, uh, very little contact or in some cases, um, no contact. Does that change where, um, for example, you know, talking about uh, where there might be um, a divorce and so mum takes the kids. Um, and when I say take, I'm not meaning um, uh, in that way in terms of there's an arrangement where mum, mum r remains with the kids. Uh, or where, for example, uh, a, a woman can go out and, and conceive now uh, in, in, in other ways and has a child. As you said, uh, there might be a boyfriend that comes com comes along, and let's say that that boyfriend becomes a partner, and it's long term. Is that sufficient? Uh, does it need to be dad? Uh, uh, is there any literature around that, or you know, is, is it about having a, a male, you know, strong male connections, role models, you know, those that that type of tension, that type of boundary setting? How does that sort of play out? 
yes, there's good news and bad news here. Um, so um, the, 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 the bad news and the good news is that, that when I started doing the research for the boy crisis, I, I, was, a, I was a stepdad. And I was hoping that, you know, the research would show that stepdads were, you know, a good stepdad was just as valuable as a good biological father. Well, I was so wrong about that. Um, I actually found this out when I started doing the research for the book before this called Father and Child Reunion. And so I sent them the manuscript of the um, of Father and Child Reunion to the, bi the biological dad of, uh, of one of our daughters. And, um, and so uh, he found it to be so compelling. He uh, negotiated with the woman who became my wife um, and the mother um, to move back in to construct, to build a different, uh, an addition onto their home and for him to move back into the home um, to be able to have more contact with the children who were doing very poorly. And so, um, and, and th so the biggest single contribution of father and child reunion was not getting, not discovering that I was a potential better parent um, for the children, but that the children needed their biological father more than they needed a stepfather. So that's the that's the good news, bad news. But there's more depth to it than this. Um, the so the the big learning there was that the bio that the children seemed to, so. For example, uh, one of my daughters um, was uh, a, 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 um, my my the woman who became my wife adopted a child. And that, um, that adopted child, uh, somebody from uh, New Zealand came over who was a rancher and met with us and had dinner with us and the adopted child and, and my wife and myself. And I uh, was telling a story about um, what, what was going on at the ranch. And one of the things that was going on with the at the ranch was that, the, um, that there was 12 ducklings that were born, but the mother and father ducklings were killed. And so, and the, and the rancher was telling us in a fascinating way, what happened was that the that the the that the, the, the ch uh, one of the chickens in the barns took a female chicken took over the parenting of these twelve ducklings, and it was fascinating to see that what they did. And so one day, the children, the ducklings got a little bit bigger, and they were able to waddle out of the barn, and they waddled down the hill, <coughs> and there was a lake at the bottom of the hill, and the ducklings jumped into the lake. And the and the chicken goes berserk, uh, and says, you know, you know, basically, you know, you're, you're gonna drown, you're gonna go in the lake, da 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 da. And the and my the adopted daughter uh, interrupted and said, that's the story of my life. I'm a ch I'm a duckling raised by a chicken. And wow. so what happens in both adopted families, and also in families where the children don't have their biological dad is that they often feel like ducklings raised by a chicken. They understand that the chicken loves them or the, the adopted mother lo uh, uh, loves them, but they don't, they don't feel that they know who they are, that the parent, the chicken, doesn't understand that fundamentally it's in me, the duck, to swim, while you fundamentally, it is not to swim. And so, um, and so I found that that, that adopted child and the child of a stepfather or, uh, with, that doesn't have contact with the biological father, the boy looks in the mirror and sees that, let's say in a divorce situation, um, he's hearing hints or direct statements that, you know, sweetie, your dad has been very irresponsible or your dad lies or your dad's been unfaithful or your dad is, you know, um, not, um, is a narcissist. Um, and so the boy looks in the mirror and says, well, you know, if my dad's this way, my, my hair, my eyes, my body language, my nose are a lot like my dad's. Um, the mom doesn't realize that half of that child is the father's genes. Um, and that child is looking at that abuse, that those, th those, those negative statements that are made about the father are actually a form of child abuse. Those are, those are being integrated into the child's psyche. And the child experiences a type of PTSD around that, post-traumatic stress syndrome, because the child can't discuss this with the father without getting the father and mother into an argument, can't discuss it with the mother without getting into a destabilization of the relationship between the mother and father that, that goes even deeper. So the child has to keep it to himself. And if it's a boy child, 
boys are already prone to keep their feelings to themselves. And this only aggravates the propensity on boys to be emotionally unintelligent by keeping their feelings even more to themselves, feeling more alone and more isolated. So now, so just two very important things to take away from this, these constructive things. So what can a, what must be done? I, I have in the Boy Crisis book for a chapter called Four, in case of divorce, the four must do's. And the headlines on those must do's are this. Number one, if you want your children to do well after divorce, make sure they have an equal amount of time between the father and the mother. Number two, make sure the father and mother live within about 20 minutes drive time from each other so the children don't resent the other parent that they're going to because and resent them because they have to miss their favorite friend's birthday party or their soccer game. Um, and so um, number three, uh, that the children are not able to detect or hear any bad mouthing or negative body language um, about the father by the mother or about by the uh, by the father about uh, by the father about the mother about by the mother about the father uh, and number four um, the most recent um, research has shown that the children who do best are ones whose parents have consistent couples counseling or relationship counseling after divorce so I wanted to get those four constructive must do's out of the way but I also want to leave some hope here for mothers who are single mothers. What can single mothers do when there's no chance of getting the father involved? First, understand that the first thing you can do is understand those nine differences between dad-style parenting and mom-style parenting. For the most part, the great majority of fathers, when they know that you value them, that you need them, men are biologically programmed to be willing to die if they're told they're needed. So every generation had its war. And every generation's war, when, we, when Uncle Sam or the equivalent of you know, the government or the culture says, you are needed to defend um, our country, um, our lifestyle, our freedoms in this war, men were willing to be disposable, to die, as a definition of masculinity. Masculinity mm -hmm. required disposability. And so boys by the age of 17, 18, 16, 15, 14, 13, when they, if they're in World War I, they learned that, that if they were willing to risk dying, they would be called a hero. So boys are very, males are very responsive to social bribes. If you tell them uh, that you are needed as a father, um, and, I, and I understand why you're needed. I don't have, I don't have as much proneness to enforce boundaries. I, I, um, I don't have as much proneness to, to do that roughhousing. I love the way you turn everything into a game. You will find fathers coming back, the biological father coming back and being involved. Number two, but if that's impossible for any number of reasons, then let me go to the next level. Get your son uh, involved in a faith-based community where the faith-based leader um, gets together other children of your son's age where they can talk about their feelings and their fears so your child doesn't feel so isolated. Get your, oh, That's one paragraph. Paragraph two, get your son involved in some equivalent of Cub, Scout, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, uh, where the boys can learn masculinity at its best and learn to do things that are constructive, how to channel their testosterone. And remember that Boy Scouts, every merit badge um, is usually um, supervised by a, um, a mentor, uh, somebody that knows something about it. So that gives boys one mentor after the other um, who help them uh, guide to being um, able to do something that is achievement oriented. Make sure your boy, your son is involved in Cub Scouts because Cub Scouts, it's a lot of hard data now showing that children involved in Cub Scouts for two years or longer with consistent attendance have better character development than control groups that are not involved with Cub Scouts. Next, get your involved with children consistent involved. Consistent male mentoring is what I Yes, it's the consistent male mentoring and the Cub Scouts ethics is one that puts a lot of emphasis on character development. And yes. I don't know a parent who, when asked about um, their children, uh, would put anything ahead of the development of good character in children. Uh, they'd rather have a child of good character who's not super successful than a child who's super successful of poor character. Um, next is uh, sports. 
Now, everybody knows that sports are important, but there are three types of sports, and it really helps children to be involved with each of these three types of sports for reasons I discussed in the boy crisis, but I'll give the headlines here. Uh, team sports are obvious. They prepare children to be part of a team, part of a corporation, part of a government entity, um, part of a cooperative network. Um, but what, one of the biggest things that is neglected is um, pickup team sports. Pickup team sports are what is wonderful preparation for preparing your child to be an entrepreneur. So <clears throat> your child goes, let's say, to um, to the school, and there's nobody there playing soccer. Um, and so um, the child sees a stranger come onto the um, onto the field and says, uh, "You know, you you want to play some type of soccer? Do you want to play basketball with me?" And so they then have to set up. Um, so the child has to make a decision about. Who do I invite to play with? Who do I not invite to play with? Um, how do I choose sides when there are more than a few children? Um, who do I want on my side? What type of rules should this be? Should this be full court or half court? Um, is, is fouling allowed? If so, what is fouling that's aggressive? What's a fouling that's assertive? Back to the roughhousing stuff again. Hundreds of decisions need to be made. If you and I are playing um, basketball and, you know, and I say, you know, Nash, pass the ball to me, pass the ball to me. And four times I ask the ball to be passed to me, but every time I do, um, I, I, miss the, I, miss the sh uh, I miss the basket. After a while, you begin to say, okay, you know, this is not a, you know, this guy just wants to hog the ball. He doesn't do it selectively. These are all the types of things that, are, that someone who runs a company from the beginning has to make all of these types of assessments. <coughs> and it's of great value to not have somebody making all the rules for you. But it's also a value to have somebody making the rules for you um, to, to get a sense of how to obey the rules as well. And then the next form of sports is what, to, uh, to complete what I call the liberal arts of sports is to make sure your son is involved or your daughter is involved in a sport that requires predominantly um, self-discipline. So swimming or just playing tennis or gymnastics. Now, all of these sports are part of, you're part of a team. You're part of a swim team, a tennis team, or a gymnastics team, but your predominant discipline is with yourself as a contributor to the team. And so, um, and so all three of those sports, um, for reasons that I, again, uh, um, and then if you're, if, you're, if you're in the United States listening to this, um, make sure you don't get your son involved in tackle football. Make sure you get your son involved in the newest type of football, which is flag football, uh, which will give your son 90% of the value of tackle football and about 1% of the concussions. And so, you know, keep your son involved in the, in, in, in the experiences and fun of the games. Um, but remember that um, um, tackle football was preparation for your son being disposable, disposable mm. war. And that is probably what you don't want to make as the primary value of your son. There's so much in there, but I'm just hearing, you know, so many uh, uh, pointers and, 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 and ideas and sort of, you know, my neurologist tr triggering, triggering all over around, in particular, you know, the, the space around conditioning and behaviorism, you know, at its absolute core, which we all are you know, designed around and we're built around and, and it's just being able to observe and notice how this all actually works. I'm assuming, before I ask you where we can get the book, I'm assuming the boy crisis is just as much for mums as it is for dads. This, this is not a, you know, how to be a dad uh, book. This is about how to understand kids and their needs, this, this tension about how, how can we do the best for our kids and many, many of the things that are applicable for boys in, in a different way are applicable for girls. Uh, it's just trying to understand, uh, uh, understand yeah. how we function. Every mother that I know with a son wants to have her son be the best possible boy, man of character, of success, of productivity, 
of uh, good emotional skills, um, be you know, financially reasonably successful, but not preoccupied with that at the expense of other things. And so these these are these are this checks and balance parenting and knowing how to orchestrate that is a both of concern to both mothers and fathers. Secondly, our daughters. I have two daughters, and um, you know I want those daughters to have males that are worthy of their company, but worthy of their marriage. Fortunately, uh, one of my daughters has found an extraordinary male uh, that is both um, you know that it, that is worthy of her in every sense of the word, and um, and that is just wonderful. Um, but we. Uh, you know, we are all in the same family boat. Uh, when only one sex wins, both sexes lose. And so you can, um, so you cannot talk about parenting without talking about the dynamic of parenting. And so um, I see the boy crisis as being um, as much for mothers as for fathers. In fact, when you know most writers have somebody in their mind who is listening as they as they write. And my predominant audience in my mind, as I wrote the Boy Crisis book, uh, was was a mother of a son. Um, but I, you know, I have found that many grandparents are very interested in this. I talk a great deal about, you know, how grandparents um, can best raise and help in raising children, and what to interfere with and what not to interfere with in relation to their children raising their their grandchildren. And um, and so there's there's so many dimensions of this that um, that need to be taken into consideration. Warren, this has also changed how I'm going to approach it. When uh, one of my I've got two daughters as well. When one of my daughters comes home with a uh, boy, if that's what they choose to to, to do, um, I'll be saying, "Look, I'm not interrogating you. I want you to bring in your mum and dad." <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have conversations about how they run the family home, um, but you know, in in, uh, in in all seriousness, I think I think that tension is is such a beautiful way of 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 looking at this and trying to be cognizant about how we're raising our our kids to 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 make them, as you say, good people. You know, yes, I I um I myself, you know, am, am probably one of those boys that. Uh, it can quite easily get lost into work and, and, and you know, uh, be preoccupied, obsessed even. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, I, I think a lot's come down to that I've got, you know, wonderful mum and dad and, and, and my wife who puts on the brakes as well. You know, all these things that, and then obviously my children, my own desires, I think these things come to shape you and I'm, I'm better for them, you know, and, 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 and you know, without them, you know, I, I wouldn't be who, who, who I am. And, and uh, uh, I think it's, it's ever evolving, but these things are just making much more sense uh, to me. So, um, you know, having two, two girls, uh, I know how important it is to have good, good uh, you know, men, men around as well um, in, in whatever capacity, whether it be, you know, as friends, as, as, as partners, as, you know, work colleagues and, and the like. It's about becoming better human beings. Where can we get The Boy Crisis and, and, and how can people find out more about you? Uh, the Boy Crisis should be available on Amazon and it's in uh, the paperback is least expensive and it's almost, <coughs> it is right now about a 30% discount on Amazon. Um, the, or I'm, I'm getting as much positive feedback about the audible version of The Boy Crisis. Right. Uh, uh, my co-author, John Gray, who wrote Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, reads the five chapters on ADHD um, that he wrote. And then um, I read, I spend five days reading the rest of the book. Um, on, uh, and I'm getting uh, a lot of uh, people who um, tend to be commuters or tend to be active on in the gym and on a, a treadmill and they're listening to it on the treadmill and it makes them look more forward to exercising or doing their commute. And, um, and it's really, I hope my voice is such that is a, a pleasing to the ear uh, as yours is. You're, you are an extremely acknowledging yet firm and sensitive person who asks good questions and then uh, listens really well. So you must be a great parent also. And so um, I hope that my voice is, um, uh, reflects some of that um, similar sensitivity. No, um, thank you. So. And I'll tell you what, I think the audio when, or audio books when they're, Actually, read by the authors is, is is so much better than than going out and hiring that out because there's nuanced, you know, aspects of how it's written and the pauses and what needs to be more emphasised, um, the character of who's writing it, you know, the, all the research that 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 you've gone out and read and digested and and assimilated in, in your mind comes out in those words. So I would I would 
highly recommend you know the, the audio version as well because not many I know that there is now a leaning towards people starting to do that um, but not everyone does that and and it, there's a vast difference so it, 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 it it's it's beautiful that you and John can can could, could do that and and I actually interviewed John not long ago as well um, uh, who you know is is is, is just as um, you know brilliant as as you um, so it's, it's wonderful what? to know that. <laughs> <laughs> It's more brilliant than I am. <laughs> a very brilliant man, indeed. But yeah. so, what? Any final words you would give to listeners about you know the things to think about in terms of you know raising raising their kids, whether it be you know uh, as a as a father or as a mother, um, and in some cases even you know it might be grandparents that are raising yeah. you know uh, uh, their, their their grandkids. If I were to leave you with one final word, um, pay attention to the parts of the book that talk about communication and particularly the parts that talk about how to be able to handle personal criticism without becoming defensive. If you're defensive when your partner, when you perceive your partner to criticize you, your partner will eventually stop criticizing you as much and keep his or her feelings to himself or herself which will mean that they'll be burying their anger or their hurt and their upset. And so as, um, and therefore, even though you may stay legally married, you'll be oftentimes emotionally divorced or be in a minimum security prison marriage. And so um, if there's anything that you pay attention to is pay attention to both the differences in dad and mom style parenting, and then also the ways of communicating that can make your marriage the type of um, create the type of love and um, bonding and depth and intimacy that would be just an extraordinary life for you, but also extraordinary role models for your children. Beautifully said and very wise, wise, wise words. Warren, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I can't thank you enough. I, th I think there's so, so many points to take away and uh, particularly for those who, who, who go out and, you know, pick up a copy of The Boy Crisis. Um, it'll be well worth worth investing that into into their children and obviously for themselves as well to, to know what they're doing is, is a great job. So thank you very much for coming onto the show. Thank you, Nash. It's been a real pleasure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review, subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out i'd love to hear from you